How do you get a postdoctoral fellowship in academia? Stick around and let's chat about the five keys today on Navigating Academia. What's up everybody, my name is Dr. Jay Phoenix Singh and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. As always, we appreciate the love, so please do take a moment to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students, subscribe to our channel, comment below, hit that bell to make sure that you get notifications every time we post new original content, and follow us at these social media accounts. So let's get right into it. Without a doubt, one of the best things that I did in my entire career in academia was to do what's called a postdoctoral fellowship. The general idea behind a postdoc is that after you've gotten your doctorate, you will do a postdoc before entering the job market to be able to get, in the US at least, an assistant professorship. And so in the US, it goes assistant, associate, full professor. Usually people go straight from grad school and they're trying to find that assistant professorship position. To be honest with you, that was my entire game plan as well. Now I'll take you through my journey very quickly to be able to let you know what I ended up doing, but let me tell you, it was the best decision that I made probably in my career, certainly at that stage. You know, to be honest with you, I think that a lot of people think to themselves, I've just busted my butt so bad when it came to doing, you know, grad school and finishing up. I just want to get going on this thing. You know, postdocs do not make as much as assistant professors. I want to make some money. I want to go out there. I really want to get started. I want to get started on the tenure clock, etc. We really want to jump the gun, right? We're, we really are so stressed out oftentimes and we're so eager, sometimes overly eager, I would argue, to be able to get into the job market that we don't realize that we can maximize the likelihood of being successful on that market by doing a postdoc first, and it also gives us a significant amount of time to decompress after that very challenging doctoral pursuit. So, to give you the one minute version for me, I finished my first doctorate at Oxford, during that time, I had read a very, what was for me a very influential piece, which was a 2001 article in this uh, journal called The American Psychologist. It was published by these two guys uh, in the United States, and when I read it, I was blown away, especially by how it was written in addition to the subject matter. And my supervisor at Oxford said, what do you want to do when you're done? And I told him, I said, I don't know who these two guys are in terms of where they're at, but I want to find out where they're at and then I want to go and work with them. And sure enough, one of them was at a university in Florida where they were accepting postdoc applications. Uh, I applied, I interviewed, I got it, I was very lucky. I moved to Florida and I was able to work with that scholar who I you know, hugely respect. Uh, and, and that really kind of kicked things off for me. Uh, when I moved down to Florida as well, I'd been in you know, rainy England here for you know, so long, so moving down to sunny Florida was a you know, total change of pace. The fact that I could wear flip-flops to work, you know, what is this magical wonderland? Uh, you know, it was it was pretty great, uh, and I, I definitely enjoyed my time for my postdoc. So that's my little rundown in terms of my personal story. Uh, but doing a postdoctoral fellowship gives you so many opportunities to be able to, like I said, to be able to chill out, to build your credentials up in terms of getting more publications, getting more grants. You know, you name it. You can really use that time to be able to get uh, positions in terms of leadership positions um, with different associations in your field. You can use it to network. You can use it to be able to build your personal brand. All of these things are critical in academia and they're going to significantly increase the likelihood of not just getting a job, but getting a job you want, which trust me on this one can be really rough especially if we're in the current academic climate where the preponderance of new academic positions are not tenure track positions, okay? The, most of them are adjunct positions. And uh, you know, the likelihood is that you wanna do academia full time and it's really tough if you're just doing full time adjuncting because you're not getting as paid as much and there's significantly less job security. So how do you get a postdoctoral fellowship? Let's very quickly go through the five different things that you need to get done. Tip number one is to get your doctorate. I know this sounds absolutely obvious, but super essential. Some people will start looking for their postdocs before they've even finished their doctorate. 
My, my genuine recommendation here is to take things one at a time. Uh, the reason why some people would jump the gun is because there's a very specific person they want to work with and they know they're accepting postdocs. Very rarely do people have more than one postdoc at a time. I, I've never heard of a case where anyone has ever had more than two at a time, uh, especially because a lot of these places, you know, if one person has a postdoc, there's large faculties, right? So unless that person has more grant funding for another postdoc, if it's just something where, you know, the postdocs getting accepted to the department in general, well, they're gonna give the next postdoc to somebody else. And these positions usually last anywhere between one to three years on the average. And so because of that, people oftentimes are not gonna be jumping ship until they get a job. So if you don't take the job then, then you could be out of luck for one to three years. So people sometimes jump the gun. But really my recommendation is to take it one step at a time, really spend the time on your doctoral dissertation, get it done, really fulfill all of your obligations and, you know, leave your doctorate with, a, you know, a good re uh, recommendation from your supervisor and leaving all bridges built. Don't burn any bridges because you want to get go fast and get the heck out of there. Trust me, in the long term, that is not a good strategy, okay? So step number one is really finish the doctorate. When you're at the point where your, uh, you know, your dissertation is finished and you're just kind of getting ready to be able to say, okay, what's the next step? You're just making five final changes and revisions, that's a great time to be able to begin the process of looking. Tip number two is to be able to try to find a department where there's a specific supervisor who you have a really good goodness of fit with. And I'm not just talking about a goodness of fit in terms of the work that you're doing, the population you're working with, your preferred methodology, but also personality wise. You know, supervisors come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are gonna be really senior, they're tenured full professors. Some folks are assistant professors, they're just really new and getting started. And depending on where your supervisor is in their career, you can have a very different experience. Obviously, people newer to the field, they're hungry, they're working on more grants, they're working on more publications, they want to do special issues, they want to do edited books, they really want to make contributions and you can hook in with them and do all kinds of stuff with them that's also going to benefit you. But they could view you as competition because you're arguably going to be in a similar position because you'll be applying to be an assistant professor in the next few years as well. So there could be some butting of heads depending on the personality of the supervisor. Or you could have somebody who's super old school who honestly, they're just resting on their laurels. They're just waiting for opportunities to come to them and there will be more than enough of them if they're a big enough name person. And they kind of just accept that, you know, they're at the point of their career where they can kind of chill a little bit more. If they want to serve on a board, their name recognition is going to let them do that. If they want to be the co-investigator on a grant, they can, you know, contact whoever a su supposed PI is going to be and they're going to be like, wow, this person's name is so much cachet, we want them on there. So it could be that you're going to have, as the postdoc, significantly fewer opportunities to learn about the little bits and bobs procedurally of getting things done that are very practical in academia. So that's just something to keep in mind. But personality is king here. I really believe that. It's the same thing as the thing about like therapy, right? A therapeutic alliance predicts the preponderance of whether or not you're going to actually be successfully treated or not. It's that relationship that you forge. Same thing with a postdoc, right? You got to make sure that supervisor is somebody you really click with. And obviously, hopefully, when the postdoc is done, you're going to stay in touch with those folks and you're going to, you know, really have a long relationship with them and you're going to help build their career. They're going to help build yours. It's really a reciprocally deterministic thing, which is pretty beautiful. So that's tip number two. Tip number three is to be able to develop, before you even start the postdoc, a publication plan uh, and making sure that you have a strong track record of publications in the past. Both of these are key. Obviously for the latter, you wanna make sure that you can prove when you're putting your application in, when somebody sees your CV or your resume, you'll have a really thriving section on publications. If you only have, let's say, one publication and you wanna be in academia, that's not very good after grad school. You know, definitely have as many as you you can, especially anything where you can be the first author, fantastic. That's really what we're looking for here. I want you to build that track record up. That can take some time, right? It's another reason to be able to pay attention to tip number one that we discussed and take your time on your doctorate to be able to make sure it's done right, submit things that are, you know, papers that 
you know, have to do with your dissertation and get that track record, that's gonna increase the likelihood you can get your dream postdoc, right? Because you'll have that track record established. And then also you wanna come up with a publication plan. Maybe you've done three papers based on your doctoral dissertation and based on their findings, you wanna do studies four, five, and six. Fantastic, you've got your publication plan, it's a roadmap, it's laid out, and you can discuss on an interview, for example, with the department that you're interested in postdocing in, or with that postdoc supervisor where you're really hopeful that they're going to accept to be able to work with you, you can explain what the goal is. If you just go in and say, yeah, I'm interested in working on some stuff on this topic, and I know you're working on, you know, such and such a grant, so I'd, you know, I'd love to get involved. Not enough, what are you doing? No. Be specific, really do the thinking, take the guesswork out of it and make it something where the supervisor is going to see the perceived goodness of fit between what they're working on and what you have to offer, what your game plan is. And this is really going to behoove you. It's really going to be helpful right down the road. Number four is grant applications and a track record of getting grants. For me, for example, I had gotten, I had only gotten a travel grant, right? Uh, to be able to go to the major national conference in the United States in my subfield when I got my postdoc, right? Uh, however, I had also worked on helping my graduate supervisor get a very famous, massive grant uh, in the UK. And so because of that, I had experience working in that realm. That was my track record. And again, I had a, a plan in terms of specific grants that I wanted to apply for. For example, National Institute of Mental Health is something, it's called the K program, right? Uh, and K grants are like early career investigator grants. So I had it really clear that my goal was to come in and be able to work on a K uh, and submit it and hopefully get it accepted. If not, to take a look at other funding mechanisms, but I already knew what I wanted to apply for. I had had it laid out exactly what I wanted. I ended up getting another grant when I was a grad student that funded my research, uh, it, which was international in nature. So, you know, it did take money to be able to get it done. Uh, and it was a fantastic opportunity to be able to build even further my track record, such that when I applied for faculty positions, people looked and they said, hey, this is pretty impressive. You know, the kids got not just one grant, it's got several grants or whatever, it's applying for a K, obviously is familiar with these grant funding mechanisms, and especially if you're applying to be at what's called an R1 university, Research One, where most of the positions are gonna be soft money positions, meaning that you, know, you eat what you kill, you get paid what grant money you kind of bring in, Oh my gosh, it's essential that you know the grant game, as it were, uh, and just every little bit and bob in there, super important. So that's number four. And tip number five is personal connections. Uh, let me tell you, there are so many ways to make personal connections in a field. Everything from, you know, just not knowing somebody and reaching out via email, reaching out via phone, telling somebody that you liked a piece that they just put out, introducing yourself in person at a conference. You know, maybe you just happen to be in town visiting a relative who happens to be in the same state right, where there's a university, where there's a department, where there's a supervisor that you wanna work with, fantastic, go and visit the person. Personal connections are everything. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. You wanna become one of those people to be able to crank through it as easy as possible uh, in terms of you know people's defenses. Initially, they're going to say, I don't know this person. And keep in mind implicit bias, right? Uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with anybody being ageist or let's say misogynist or racist or anything like this, but we do know based on the research literature that, you know, these things, the considerations very rarely are blinded. So if you have a name, like, you know, like my last name, Singh, okay, people hear Singh and they know that I'm not Irish, okay? Uh, so they're probably think it's like, oh, he's like a Punjabi or he's, you know, a Sadarj or he's, you know, he's Sikh, he's South Asian, you know, somewhere, maybe he's Sri Lankan, maybe he's Pakistani, maybe he's Indian, whatever. They'll see it and they make attributions. And it's not because there's anything wrong with them, it's because this is how our brain works, right? Uh, and if you've ever read Daniel Kahneman's stuff, his book is great, you know, Thinking Fast and Slow, you'll know that this is not something that's bad, doesn't make anybody a bad person, it's just an automatic thing. You wanna make sure that you go beyond kind of an out group and you get into the person's in group and you can do that through establishing personal connections. So make sure to the extent possible that you get in touch with them, maybe you're 
your supervisor knows them or you have some colleague you've worked on with a project who knows them where they can send an introductory email that you can follow up on and schedule a phone call or an in-person coffee or something at a conference you'll both be at, whatever it is, but don't be afraid to reach out. A lot of people say, yeah, but they're such a big name or they're very influential to me, I don't know what to do. The worst thing you can do is nothing. And like we always talk about on this channel, nobody's going to be a stronger advocate for your own work and yourself than you. So make sure that you take responsibility for that because it'll pay dividends. All right, everybody, thank you so much for stopping by and watching this episode. Please remember to like this video right now. Go ahead, click it, click the thumbs up. Uh, and also please comment below, even if it's something like, I love this video, which we would really appreciate because it will help to be able to boost us on the YouTube algorithm. So super appreciate it. Uh, in addition, if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career mentoring with me, you can go ahead and sign up via this website below. We can set up a session together uh, and we can talk about, you know, what's your dream postdoc and how can we position you to be in the chance to be able to have the best chance of actually locking that position down. I'd love to hear from you. Signing off, everyone. Have a great day, and don't forget to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.